late, we want to drive slowly and stop and pick up the salamanders and help them across the road. So, Andrea Shortsleeve yep. and Hannah Dallas from uh, Fish and Wildlife are here to uh, talk to us about creating wildlife habitat. And this is being um, videotaped by BCTV so that you can watch it over and over and over. It'll be on the Dummerston Conservation Commission website and also on BCTV for et eternity, I think. I don't know what's ever going to happen to that stuff. So anyway, there, there it is. So, um, so turn it okay. over to you guys. Great. Yeah. Great. So, um, great. So my name is Andrea. I work for Fish and Wildlife. I'm a private lands habitat biologist, so I work my sole job is to work with private landowners here in Vermont, which is great. And Hannah works for um, Vermont Forest Parks and Ref, Rec, FPR. And I don't know if you want to explain your job a little bit. Yeah, I, um, I'm a private lands forester also. So I work with uh, NRCS folks primarily and um, work on private land. So, so we're going to talk a little bit about why Vermont's cool, why the forests here are the way they are, the history of the forest and the way that uh, Vermont's kind of been settled. And we're going to talk about um, different things you can do on your property to um, influence and improve habitat for wildlife. And then um, Hannah's going to go through some different practices that we help um, fund and implement with the NRCS program, EQIP. So if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt us at any time. And um, we have tons of handouts on the front, the front table if you need to scoot out early, make sure you grab some of those. And we also have, we have two sign-up sheets. We have one on the table out there and one here. If you would like to have either one of us or one of our colleagues come to your property and walk around and we can talk habitat and forest health. So we'll have that. But, okay. So right off the bat, we are part of the largest contiguous temperate broad, broadly forest in, in the world. So what that means is we are part of one of the biggest contiguous forests in the globe. So what, what we have here is really important, and we, um, it's really important to keep connections between um, the Adirondacks in Vermont or in New York through Vermont up to the Acadian Peninsula um, up in Canada. So it's just really cool to, to be part of this large, globally important forest. And what we've done is, oh, oh and there we are. So we're right on the edge of it down here in Dummerston. <laughs> um, and so what we've done is we've mapped out these really cool corridors where um, they're connected forests from each side where plants and animals can move throughout this globally important region. Um, and you can see Vermont's basically in the crossroads of some, some pretty important corridors. And just to bring it, zoom it in to where we are in Vermont down on the red star, um, all of that blue color is our connected forest. You can see it running up along the spine of the Green Mountains and into um, the Northeast Kingdom and over to uh, New York over there. So we like where we are right now. We're in a very important connecting connecting area. And so, like, why does it matter? We talk about this in the context of climate change. And as you can see, in the next 70 to 50 to 70 years, they're predicting our climate is going to become more like northern Georgia, which is really different. Um, and so the best way that we can make sure our wildlife and our, our forests are the same or resilient to that climate change is to make sure that we provide connections in between the different habitats. Um, so it's really, in this picture here, I don't want to get too close because of the camera, but um, it's not enough to just save these patches of oak forest and save a patch of riparian area. Say, pr pretending that we have all the parts is not going to, um, not going to matter unless they're connected. And we have to think about connections like that on a couple different scales. A lot of times when we talk about corridors and wildlife connections, we think about really big animals like moose and bear, just because they're the most obvious things on the landscape sometimes, and they need the largest, deepest, darkest forest to be connected. But we also need to think about salamanders, amphibians, like they're, they're going to be uh, crossing the roads tonight. That's, we have to make sure that we have corridors for them and also for things like pollinators which, you know, of course they're a lot smaller, so their corridors are going to be a lot smaller. But when you're out in your fields mowing, um, if you consider keeping buffers on your, on, your, on your fields so you don't mow all the way to the edge, you're creating and continuing a connection for those little insects that need to jump from uh, side to side on the field. And so when we start looking at different wildlife species and these different forest patches, um, you can see how important 
these large areas can be in keeping these connections together. And I know this slide is terrible, and I know probably, I can't, I can't even read it up here, but on the, the far, on your left, um, that is a large undeveloped forest patch, and that's a list of all the wildlife species that you're going to find in a patch like that. And as you move closer to my, my side of the screen, you are getting into smaller and smaller forest blocks. And so you can see all of the wildlife, all these different species that drop out until when you're in a, a 1 to 20 acre block, the only wildlife you're really going to see are those kind of urban animals like raccoons, um, opossums, things like that that can really thrive in kind of an a urban human area. So it just kind of shows like, why it's important to keep these large blocks of forest connected and undeveloped. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I don't have this on my handout, but I can make it available if you if you give me your email address, I can send it to you. That's great. Okay. <laughs> so just one more time, just to drive kind of our point home about why Vermont's important, why our forests are important globally. Um, we've got these colored blocks in Vermont. This is all the forests that are highlighted. These are the, our, our big priority forested blocks that we see along the spine of the Green Mountain, and just where. The kind of the direction that animals and plants are going to be moving through the state. And there we are again. <laughs> so this is, this is kind of a typical view of Vermont that we see now. This is in Stowe, so it's beautiful, forested. This is kind of the iconic picture that we, we think of Vermont. But Vermont's not always looked that way. A hundred years ago, there was hardly any forest in Vermont left. Um, we went from a state that was about 86% forested down to a state that was about 25% forested. So when you look out on the landscape now, I mean, it's just kind of an amazing recovery of what we've, we've um, reforested our state to look like. But here's a picture of kind of the height of the logging boom in Vermont uh, with logs going down the White River in Sharon. And here's a picture of Dummerston. Um, so they weren't sure of the date, somewhere between 1880 to 1920, um, which looks totally different than where you're going to see driving around Emerson today. You see there's no vegetation along the riverbanks and the hillsides, it's pretty, pretty sparse. So just to give you an idea of kind of where we've come from. And uh, just another comparison, this is looking out of, out in Brownsville, um, the scene from the 1950s, and then again, it's a little dark, a little hard to see, but uh, it's all forested in that 2005 <coughs> picture. And one more with our state capital, just kind of see the difference of, of how it looked when it was in the early, early 1870s time. So here's just a, a quick graph of what I've kind of been uh, explaining the last couple slides. So we have um, the percentage of forest cover in Vermont before uh, European settlement in the 1620s. It um, goes down to uh, the 19, 1910 is kind of the height of land clearing when people were here uh, using sheep um, for agriculture and then moving into dairy cows. Um, some estimates show that the forest cover in Vermont was down below uh, to 20%. And then um, you can see as we've moved closer to present time how that's recovered. Pretty remarkable. And of course, this is going to impact the type of animals that we have on the landscape. Um, you know, some, some animals have disappeared from that original forest clearing, and we're probably never going to get it back, get them back. And that's also, you know, not just a function of the clearing of the forest, but also a function of, of just um, changing climates, changing development, fragmentation, um, urbanization of, of the landscape. Um, but then you can also see, you know, some animals, mountain lions, wolves, were extirpated due to overharvesting, unregulated harvesting. Um, and then we have some animals that have been brought back into the population, um, mostly by reintroductions done by the Fish and Wildlife Department over the years. And that is turkey, marten, fisher, and some animals like that that are very present on the landscape now. Um, and then, of course, as as the climate has warmed over the last couple of centuries. Um, we have some animals moving up from the south that do well in these kind of fragmented, more urban areas um, like coyote and the opossum. Um, so just kind of where we were and where we've come. Yep. Are we different from the green section with beavers and fishes? Um, no. I'm trying to, trying to remember why those are all in a different... I think those are animals that were either reintroduced and have healthy populations now. Um, I don't have a, a, a line just for weasels. We have fisher and beaver in that category, but I think those are, those are populations that are doing well. They, they blinked out for a while, but they're now doing fine on the landscape. 
so this is really, you know, this is important. I kind of talked about why this is globally important with our, our, our important forests and our connections. Um, but it's really important that we have all of you involved and interested in wildlife and forests in Vermont because 85% of Vermont is privately owned. Um, Vermont's got about 4.4 million acres of forests and 80% of that is, is privately owned. So if we want to talk about forest stewardship and the, the future of wildlife and the future of our forests in Vermont, it can't be reliant on the state or federal, federal properties. It's reliant on, on you all as private landowners. And so that's why you know, our, our agency has put a lot of time and effort into developing programs to work with landowners and hired people like Hannah and myself to, do, to come and, and work on private lands. Um, that map just shows, you can see where the Green Mountain National Forest is and um, some of the national wildlife refuges, but everything else in that brown color in Vermont is, is private land. And so it's, Vermont's kind of unique in that way be, that it is so heavily privately owned, and part of that is due to the way that Vermont was settled. It was settled a lot differently than other states in New England, like Massachusetts and Connecticut. So it was settled, first of all, it was settled a little later, and most of New England, like in Massachusetts, Connecticut, the southern areas, when, when area was settled, um, it was surrounding a village green and surrounding a church in the middle of the village. So people brought their cattle and their sheep and everything grazed in the village green. They lived in town and then they would go out to the fields and, and work in the fields and then come back into town during the day. When Vermont was settled, families came up in different waves and they wanted, everyone kind of struck out on their own. They every, everyone developed their own subsistence farms. So people started settling Vermont in 50 to 100 acre parcels. Um, and every, everyone was kind of on their own. There's little, little areas of settlements, but the majority was spread across the landscape. And so that, you still see that today when you start looking at our population. Um, the, the latest census shows that we're the second most rural state, just very closely behind Maine. They just edges us out a little bit um, in terms of the percent of the population that lives outside of an urban area. So the census, co census considers an urban area to be an area that has a population of 2,500 people. 61% um, of our population lives outside of an urban area, which is pretty remarkable, especially when you consider states like Alaska and Wyoming, where they have a ton, a ton of rural land, but all of their populations are clustered in these urban centers. So that kind of just sets Vermont apart from a lot of other states in, in the country. Um, you know, some other rural areas are like, in this, when you talk about it this way, it was like Mississippi and Arkansas, but um, Vermont and Maine are, are the most rural states in the country with the population. And so it's, it's important to note that in our country over the last 100 years, our population has moved from a, a 50 to 50% 50 um, urban rural population to a population that over 80% of, of the people in, in America live in urban areas. So we went, in the last 100 years, we had 50% of people living in rural areas to now only one-fifth of, of the entire population um, living out in the woods. And so it's kind of, you know, it just kind of, Vermont's unique in that way, and I think it's important to point that out. So again, you know, we talked about privately owned land and why landowners are important. Um, we're really, really excited that when we do surveys, um, talking to landowners and talking to forest owners, one of their primary reasons to own land is because they enjoy wildlife and they enjoy the beauty of, of their property. They enjoy recreating on their own property and they enjoy seeing, seeing um, different wildlife, hunting wildlife and fishing on their property. So Hannah and I spend a lot of time visiting, visiting landowners and so I'm just going to kind of go briefly through a couple things that we generally say to almost every, every property that we go to. Um, just kind of things to keep in mind if you know if you are looking to do improvements on your property these are some things that you can just improve on your own or you can also sign up to do one of um, one of our, our programs that we do and we can help fund some of this work um, so one of the first things that we always talk about with private landowners is that active management is good there's often oftentimes kind of a misconception that um, you know, it'll just figure itself out. I don't need to do anything. But we, we work really hard to talk to landowners and tell people, you know, get involved in your property. Start, start seeing what's out there. Um, start, you know, checking for invasive species. Active management is good for wildlife. Cutting trees is good for wildlife. And so that's, that's something that we um, really try to, try to send home. 
Another thing that we see quite often on um, different properties is just a lack of what we call structural diversity in people's forests. So when I showed the graph of the forest in Vermont population, or the, the amount of forested cover in Vermont dropping really rapidly over a couple of hundred years, it's because you know, everyone moved up, everyone kind of cleared their, their little farms out. Um, and so we had basically every, everything on the landscape was um, a single age class. It was all basically used for agriculture. And then after the Civil War, a lot of farms and agricultural businesses either folded or people started to move out west. And so the landscape um, started to revert back to forest at the same time. And so what that means is that a lot of our forests are very similarly aged. Everything started growing at the same time. Whereas if there was a natural landscape where people didn't clear it, um, you know, two, 150 years ago, there'd be pockets of, of new forests, pockets of old forests. Um, it would be a lot more diverse. And so what we see is a lot of areas that kind of just look like this. Um, there's not a lot of structural diversity. The, the forests are all kind of the same age. Um, these are two, two different pictures. One's in St. Albans up in Franklin County and one's over in Wells in Rutland County. And they look exactly the same. And I'm sure we could go out in the forest here and take the exact same picture. Um, it just is not, it's not great for wildlife. There's not a lot of things that can live in that forest right there. And it's also not very profitable if you're going to start um, you know, trying, to, trying to make some money on, on some logs and just not a healthy forest. And so what we like to see, what you can do on your property is start creating gaps, start creating structural diversity that really um, creates a lot more homes for different animals. Different bird species live at all different levels in the forest. Some live in the high canopy, but there's a lot of birds that nest on the ground and in the mid-levels. Um, salamanders and other animals need a lot of uh, structure on the forest and they need a lot of cover. Um, and so on your properties you can start creating holes in the canopy and start getting sunlight back on the forest floor so things can start growing. So that's something we, we talk about quite often with landowners. Um, also talking about structural diversity, we also talk about not just live vegetation, but we also talk about dead vegetation. So snags and dent trees are super important to wildlife. It's one of the most important habitat features that you can have on your property. Um, tons of animals from mammals, you can see, well, if, if the picture was darker, you could see a little bear cub uh, poking its head out of, out of the snag there on the bottom. Um, tons of birds use uh, all sorts of snags, including woodpeckers. If your snag is near um, water, you could have wood ducks or mergansers nesting there, and then the, the ducklings will jump out in the water. Um, but not just, not just these big animals. Um, tons of insects and amphibians also make their homes in these snags, and they're critically important for our bat species, which, as I'm sure you all know, are, are facing a pretty desperate decline right now. Um, so when we're out in properties, we try to encourage people to keep um, snags as much as possible. And then, of course, when the snag falls down, it becomes a down woody material, which is also a great wildlife resource. And it's also great for your soils, because that's going to help keep moisture in your soil. It's going to help nutrition and nutrients come back into the soil. Um, and it's important for a ton of amphibians and small mammals and other critters. It's also important for your animals like grouse that are going to stand on these um, coarse coarse woody material or these logs and drum and you know get their get their ladies attention so and with yeah. the high rains that we've been having also mm -hmm. recently the more coarse woody material you have the slower the water is going to move and it prevents a lot of erosion actually that's a great point so like that picture of Dummerston with there's no vegetation on the on the the riparian area a lot of this coarse woody debris is what we we encourage and that would have um, really slow down any of that uh, erosion on that riverside. Let's see, so another thing that we see, and this is kind of more of a landscape level thing, it, you, you're not necessarily able to control this on your individual property, but is fragmentation and parcelization. And so as, as taxes get more expensive, as people get older and they want to move off their, their property, we see a lot of people starting to sell par smaller parts of their property and kind of parcelize that off. And so that can, be, um, that can be damaging to wildlife in a couple ways. Um, one, it's harder to manage on a smaller property. So if any of the, any of the, pro the programs that we're going to be talking about, 
it gets harder to do some of these projects on smaller and smaller properties just because of equipment costs and things like that. But also it just creates more barriers for wildlife um, for their connections and, and movement across landscapes. So when um, we talk to landowners about putting in roads or putting in trails, we try to keep this fragmented parcelization some, um, kind of in mind. And of course, as you create different chunks of forest and you fragment it down, um, you're going to be dealing with different species. Some species really need that interior forest um, and that you're not going to see on these smaller lots like I mentioned earlier. Um, and so we talk about those as interior species and then edge species. So like black bears, um, different uh, like hermit thrushes need these, wood thrushes need these interior forests, whereas other animals are going to do better on the, the outskirts. And then, of course, um, basically every property that we go to has some sort of invasive plant on it, which is unfortunate, but it's the reality of, of where we live. Um, native plants often come from either um, escaped ornamentals, plants that are sold at greenhouses and landscaping, um, and they tend to flourish in our woods, um, or they're just brought in inadvertently um, through transport. Um, there's a, there's a lot of different reasons why we try to um, eliminate these from our, our forests or eradicate them as much as we can. Um, some of them is because they inhibit natural forest regeneration. Um, Hannah's going to talk a little bit about that. Um, they also provide very poor nutrition for our wildlife species. So um, plants like honeysuckle and barberry have these bright red berries that are really attractive to birds. But what they are, um, they're low in nutrients and they're diuretics. So basically the birds spend their time filling up on junk food and they get very little nutrition out of it um, and deposit their seeds immediately. So that's why you're going to see a lot of um, invasive species along like telephone lines or fence, you know, fence lines because that's where the birds are sitting and they're pooping and that's where the seeds come from. Um, also here, real close to home, um, these plants like barberry are host to ticks. The ticks really thrive in these, this vegetation. So there's a lot of different reasons, human health, wildlife health, forest health, um, that we want to try to fight invasive plants. So as landowners, you have a lot of different options um, and a lot of different resources available to you. Uh, some of them are online, like our ANR um, computer programs, the Natural Resources Atlas, where you can zoom in to your property, you can pull up different layers and see what's on your property, if you have vernal pools, if you have different cool rare natural communities on your property. It's a really cool free website. Um, our department puts out, has put out this new book. It's uh, two years old now. It's a habitat guide for landowners, and it's, it's really informative. It's got a ton of different... Um, habitats and wildlife species if, you're, if you want to focus on. Um, we sell it for $12. I don't have any copies here, but um, if you call your Fish and Wildlife office, like in Springfield, or um, I guess where the... Springfield would probably be the closest one. Um, you can order one of these and we'll mail it to you. Um, and then, of course, consulting foresters are also a, a great source of, of help for landowners. Um, there's also a bunch of different different organizations that we partner with quite often. Um, there's a new one called Backyards Woods from UVM, UVM Extension, and it's focused on landowners that own property that are smaller than 20 acres. So if you own property that um, is kind of small, you just need some ideas and, and want, want some advice, um, it's a great program to sign up for, and they do walks out in the woods, and it's, um, they provide webinar uh, talks with a bunch of different professionals. Um, and then, we work quite closely with Audubon, and they've got a number of different resources. You can have a bird assessment done on your property. Um, you can have yeah, professionals come out and help look at your management plan to make it more bird friendly. And they also have this cool database on their website where you can put your address in, type in what kind of plant you're looking for, if it's a shrub or a tree or you know, a perennial, and they'll recommend different native plants that are good for wildlife. Uh, it's really informative. Um, out on the table, I have a pamphlet for coverts for wildlife, um, which is a great organization. They do a free three-day training, two, two three-day trainings every year to talk to landowners and develop a network of, of um, peers to just talk about different, different issues on owning land. Um, and then, of course, we work with uh, Vermont Woodlands Association and their tree farm committee, uh, which provides a lot of great support for recreation and wildlife support in addition to doing timber harvest on your property. 
So these are all great, um, great resources. And if you have any questions about how to access them or whatever, um, just feel free to ask me. And I didn't think it was going to be really productive to like write out a bunch of different URL addresses. So just give me, give me a shout if you want any more information on those. Um, and then, of course, a quick plug for me and Hannah. If um, you want us to come out to your property, just feel free to give us a call, um, even if I mean, I've visited property that's you know, smaller than five acres, so you know, we'll, we'll come out and, and make the time to, to come walk your property and, and talk to you about what you can do or just answer questions. So I guess with that, um, we're going to switch gears, and Hannah's going to talk about some of the different programs we have in Vermont, and we have to do a little bit of a mic change, so I don't know. All right, so I'm Hannah Dallas again. Um, I work for Vermont Forest Parks and Rec. Um, and they, Andrea and I, so Andrea with Forest, or sorry, Fish and Wildlife, and with Forest Parks and Rec, we partner with NRCS, which is a USDA program. Um, they have a lot of, you may have heard of them, they do a lot um, with agriculture, and then they kind of outsource some of the wildlife and forestry aspects of that. So we plan um, a lot of projects for them, and there's cost share money that landowners can get to do um, certain projects. So I'll go through um, the most common of those pro uh, projects that we work with, and then how to kind of get you started and get you going if you're interested in them. So we work with EQIP, Environmental Quality Incentive Program. Um, one of the first steps is to sign up with an NRCS office. There's one right in Brattleboro. You would meet with Sylvia Harris, who is the USDA um, employee there. And then she would let us know that you have signed up and we'd come out and walk the property. If you let her know that you're interested in wildlife or let her know that you're interested in forestry, um, she might tell Andrea or myself, um, or we might just both come out if you're interested in both. So the idea of the cost share programs is to resolve um, some resource issues. So it's, it's taxpayer money, so it's kind of looking at the greater good. Um, so we're looking at things like water quality, um, invasive plants that are kind of an issue across um, a landscape level because they're, they're an issue for pollinators, regeneration, general health, um, resiliency in forests. Um, we also are looking at wildlife, um, so looking at mass trees, and I'll, I'll get into more of the details, but um, really looking at things that would benefit the greater good, since it's taxpayer money. Um, so we're always looking for a resource concern. Um, and then we also focus on some of the non-commercial forestry projects, um, things that would cost you as a landowner uh, money to get those projects done, so something like um, timber stand improvement where you're not you're not harvesting logs yet you're really just doing kind of that maintenance work so then there's within NRCS there's also CSP um, conservation stewardship program which is another side of NRCS which looks at landowners that have been doing really good management on their own for a number of years and um, how we can maybe kind of incentivize those landowners to do a little bit more to go above and beyond. Um, so it's another cost share program. You have to do some practices, but really it's looking at those landowners that have been doing um, that maintenance work for a long time. So just generally the process overview, a landowner would apply with NRCS. Um, you can also sign up on one of our sheets and then we can get you in contact with somebody that would um, get you to fill out the applications and get the paperwork done. But you apply, then we do a site visit. So we come and walk your property with you, talk about what your goals are, what you're looking for. Um, then we do planning. So our side of things, we're going to be out there when we come and visit you with a GPS and a um, map and notes and we're going to take plots and kind of figure out what needs to be done. So this map is of a property um, in Newfane. So I walked the property and the forest roads were left in a really bad shape um, by not this landowner but a previous landowner. That's a resource concern. 
Um, so we're looking to fix up those roads. And then they also had some mass trees on their property, some red oaks. We can release those. That's the blue. And then their forest, like Andrea talked about before, is all pretty even aged. It doesn't have a lot going on um, for diversity for wildlife. And so we decided we'd put in a two acre patch cut at the top of the property. Um, and so that patch cut is going to really get some good sunlight down on the forest floor, get some new growth going, and then start um, adding to that and kind of building from there, get some, get some new forest and some vegetation and raspberries and things for wildlife to really thrive in. Um, so then, uh, sorry, after the planning, then we do ranking. So NRCS ranks projects um, based on their kind of overall benefit to the state of Vermont. Um, so you're ranked against other properties based on their projects. And then if you um, qualify and you have enough points through the ranking, then there's contracting and you actually sit down with NRCS and us again and we come up with a real a plan. So it's, it is a contract that you're obligated to follow. Um, but we make sure it's something you're comfortable with before you get started. And then we implement the projects and then I return and um, certify that it's been done and then the money is issued to you. So it's a reimbursement, um, but it is, it's a pretty simple process. It seems complicated. Most people think it's really complicated when they get started, but it's really, we'll walk you through it um, the whole way. We yes, I'm about sorry. releasing, I think, red oaks. Yeah. And how would you do that? What's, what's involved in, in that? And There's a slide, and we'll get into the details of okay. each of the projects. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, it's hard to talk about it and not, not give all the projects away. Um, so one of the first ones is riparian buffer planting. So if you have a stream, like the stream Andrea was showing at the very beginning, it doesn't have vegetative cover. It needs something to stabilize the banks. We would come, we would take um, some, some pictures and kind of assess what needs to be done and then, um, and then we would help to implement a planting. So it would be native species, of course. Um, a lot of times these plantings are actually following um, if the invasives have been removed from that stream bank because you don't want invasives, they're not stabilizing the bank. Um, then you do need something there, so we would help you plant natives. Um, we, yeah, usually include species that are beneficial to wildlife, um, and they're usually quite a variety of species. <coughs> Another practice that NRCS helps to fund is um, kind of merging uh, timber management and songbird habitat management. Um, so there's a lot that you can do just by tweaking um, logging and, and harvesting just a little bit. You can really benefit um, birds and create good habitat for them. Um, so it's kind of dual purpose cutting. Um, and the guidelines for this were also, they were developed by Vermont Audubon in um, along with NRCS. So they're really they're focused on birds, but they um, can also get some cutting done in areas where you maybe don't have valuable timber and you want something to start over and, and you want to do it in a way that is um, good for your forest health and good for bird health. So another practice that I deal with um, quite a bit is forest stand improvement. So this is all pre-commercial work. So it's small timber um, you're looking at stands that are nine inches or smaller. Um, we want to work in areas that are three acres and larger. So you're not doing just your like two or half acre kind of pole size timber here and there, but it's really work that um, is going to be beneficial to your overall forest health. So it might be kind of stagnant and we're looking to kind of tip the scales, select some good timber species, some straight trees, some healthy trees, um, and get that work done. Um, it also, and there's a bullet here, it can um, create small gaps also. So that's 
going back to that structure that Andrea was talking about, um, if you have like a stand that's all the same age and it's been growing really fast, you can go in and kind of select a couple pockets where you open it up, get even more sunlight on the ground, and start another class of regeneration coming up. So forest trails and stream crossings, like I talked about um, with that planning slide. Um, there's a lot of properties that are in current use. UVA, any properties in current use? Yeah, so um, when you're in current use, you have to be following the AMPs, Vermont's Acceptable Management Practices for Water Quality. That means having water bars on your roads, stabilizing your roads, not letting them erode, or having water sit in ruts. Um, but a lot of people inherit properties that have issues and they don't quite know what to do. It costs a lot of money to fix up roads, but it's not necessarily your fault that the roads are in such bad shape. Or some people had some um, pretty decent water bars, but we had some really strong rains and those water bars washed out and now we're looking to fix those up. Um, so it's, it's NRCS money that can help a landowner fix up roads that are eroding and put in water bars and structures that follow the AMPs of Vermont. So we're increasing water quality and then we're reducing soil, soil erosion as well. This is the patch cut um, slide. So patch cuts, we're looking at two acres or two acres to eight acres, um, we're interested in creating young forests. So we're looking at a stagnant forest like Andrea had the slide of, and we want to get, get more happening on that, that piece of land. So we're losing a lot of this habitat in Vermont because we're all, most of our forests are very stagnant and at this uh, generally somewhere between 50 and 100 years old. and. Uh, and they, that means if we're losing that habitat, we've also lost the food for a lot of wildlife, cover for a lot of wildlife, um, and <coughs> timber value is just really stagnant at that point. Um, so we consider putting these areas, these patch cuts, um, <coughs> in pasture pine, um, which is kind of that junky pine. Everybody's probably seen it. It's pretty classic in Vermont. Um, we also look at some of the declining early successional hardwoods. So um, you might have some birch stands or um, aspen or poplar stands that are just really not doing anything and nothing has come in and filled in the understory. And that might be because you have invasives in the understory. So in um, that case, NRCS would help you take care of the invasives and then help you do something like a patch cut to get new growth and native growth in that area. Um, and then there's also a lot of properties in Vermont that have been previously high graded. And I, I say I would much rather see a big patch cut or clear cut than a high graded forest. Because when you have a high graded forest, your whole forest health is declining. They've less, left the worst trees rather than just opening it up and letting everything compete. So in those cases, we would come in and we'd, we'd do a, a patch cut and we want to start over. We're looking to get new genetics in that area. We're looking to get new growth for wildlife and for timber. What's high graded? What's that? Sorry, high graded. Um, so you're coming, a, a logger historically, or I mean it still happens, but um, came into the forest and took only the best trees. So they they left all the junky trees, anything that wasn't worth anything, um, and that was what was left to continue to grow. Thanks. Yep. So when we implement one of these um, patch cuts with NRCS, there are rules, and we we are focused on um, not just not just taking the best. We want to make sure that we're doing it in such a manner that we're encouraging growth so in and wildlife so we're leaving standing dead trees which um, the bottom picture it's hard to see but the bottom picture you can tell that those trees are um, dead mostly um, 
and those are great for um, for birds of all sorts, raptors, and then we're also leaving a lot of woody material on the ground. Um, so the top picture, you might be able to see it, but um, there's a lot of woody material on the ground that's great for, um, really it keeps the moisture in the soil. It prevents deer from browsing too heavily on your regeneration. Um, it's really good for amphibians and all sorts of things. Andrea can certainly give you the list of of uh, animals that would use that. Um, and so there's, there's certain, um, there are certain standards that NRCS has. We say we want to see four standing dead trees per acre and four of the largest woody debris on the ground per acre. Um, and then we also allow some uh, seed trees and some canopy left, so you want to select, like maybe you have a beautiful red oak in the middle, and there's only one, but you want to leave that. That's your seed source that's going to continue to produce mast. Um, maybe it's a black cherry, maybe it's just some other tree that you really want to hold on to. But um, we like to leave a couple trees as, as seed source and um, just to kind of continue for vertical structure. <coughs> so we keep talking about this. Um, and I'm sure everybody knows about this, but NRCS will help fund um, invasive work. So treating invasive plants that are on your um, property. So we have recognized that they're really expensive to treat on your own. Um, it makes regeneration really difficult. It makes um, just moving through your forest, enjoying your forest. It's um, human health issue, if you have ticks on your property. Um, so we want to help get rid of the invasives. There are caveats. So there's certain areas that are just too dense and too far gone to um, come in and do this work. But for the most part, we can usually come up with a strategy. So we want to approach it um, in a logical way. And we want to um, make sure that there's something to take, play, take over native um, in the areas that we're treating for invasives. So NRCS does use herbicide control on most of this invasive work, um, and we can talk a little bit more about that, especially if any of you are coming to the Saturday landowner talk where we're actually out in the field. Um, there'll be some foresters out there that do this um, invasive treatment that are great to talk to. Um, and NRCS also um, offers multiple entries now, so we are able to treat it more than once and do follow-up work. Um, and it really makes it, brings it to a point where it's manageable by a landowner. Sometimes you might look out at a patch of honeysuckle or barberry and just say, how am I ever going to start with this? How am I ever going to regain this land? Um, and so NRCS recognizes that it can be really daunting. They'll help get you started, and then uh, you can move forward with hand pulling or something like that. So here's a list of common invasive plants in Vermont. Um, you can read through them. There's more. They're always adding more. Um, landowners will call us up, or we'll go out to a property, and they'll kind of bring us around and say, like, oh, do you know what this is? And you're like, well, I don't know, but it certainly looks like it's taking over that whole back half of your yard. So um, some plants aren't on the list, but they're certainly acting in a way that are invasive, and we really want to manage those too. All right, so mass trees. Um, mass trees are really important for wildlife. So these are sources of food. So um, there is soft mass and hard mass. Um, apples are something like soft mass, where the, the flesh is squishy. Um, acorns are hard mass, um, where it's a, a hard nut. But um, the most common ones we find in Vermont, oak, black cherry, yellow birch, um, also black birch, uh, bitternut hickory, shagbark hickory, service berry or shad, um, American beech and apple. There's others here and there, but um, these are the most common. And so what we're looking for when we go out in a forest and a landowner is interested in improving wildlife habitat, and they have some of these species on their 
on their properties, we say, well, maybe if you release the crowns of these trees, you can get um, increased mass. You can also get increased timber value usually in these same trees because um, it just happens that these are these trees are valuable for wildlife and for timber, but the focus is for wildlife. But you're releasing the crowns, and by releasing the crowns, you increase photosynthesis, and that tree starts to put out more and more mast each year, um, which means more food for wildlife. So the picture here, you can see it's not the same tree, but it's the same concept. You can see where the tree's crowns are all um, really crowded in there, and what we're doing is we're selecting the mass tree and then we're looking around that tree at the crowns that are touching and those trees that are touching the mass tree get cut. So it's usually on um, three to four sides. You're releasing that crown, you want to give that crown room to grow. And not just room for one year, trees will grow really quickly in one year and fill that space, but room for up to like 10 years even. So you really want to open it up, give it a lot of light, give it a lot of room to grow. <clears throat> so apple tree release, very similar concept, but with apple trees, there's a lot of apple trees that are scattered across the landscape because, as Andrea said, this area was all farmed, people had apple trees, um, but those got abandoned and forests moved in and crowded them out. But we can still find them, and when we do find them and the landowner is interested in it, we can open them up and release them. So similar idea, we want to open them up three to four sides, give them a lot of sunlight, Apple trees, they can look really dead and you open them up enough and they will respond and they will grow brand new branches and start producing fruit that you never knew and, and um, wildlife will just flock to those trees. So it's really important when we do these practices that you're not just opening up the trees a little bit, not just cutting one tree here, one tree there, but really giving that tree a lot of light and that's what it wants. There's also pollinator enhancements that NRCS will help fund. So doing delayed mowing um, on a field where you can delay the mowing either um, within a season or delay it um, and do it like every other year. So delaying it um, until after pollinators and birds have used that area um, and then also you can do rotational mowing, so maybe mowing a strip or a section one year and then moving to another section another year. Um, and then there's also plantings for pollinators. Um, Andrea can certainly speak to these practices a little bit more than I can, um, since they're out in a field and I feel mostly in the forest. But, um, but yeah, if you're interested in these, I'm not the person to talk to, but Andrea can certainly help. Um, and then if you don't have a management plan, um, NRCS won't actually fund any activities on your property until you get a management plan. So mm -hmm. NRCS wants to see that you have a long-term goal for your property. You're not just kind of doing this now for the money and then going to be like developing or <laughs> doing something else. Um, they want to see that you have a mind towards managing your property on the long-term scale. So if you don't have a management plan, then they will help fund um, a management plan with um, a forester would write that plan. And then you can also have input from wildlife biologists. Um, and most of the foresters that would be working on these plans definitely have um, some wildlife background and other ideas. And it's really, it's focused on your goals and objectives. It's just kind of putting them in a plan that, that you can refer to and follow. Um, and it also comes with some nice maps usually and, and some uh, goals for the property. All right, so mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. and I guess, Before we do questions, do you want to talk about Saturday? Sure. I forgot the beginning. Yeah, sure. All right, so we'll skip ahead. So Saturday, I mentioned it, um, we are going to have a landowner walkthrough in Putney. Um, so we've done some NRCS projects on a property in Putney, the side Botham property. Um, and we have permission from the landowner and the foresters that worked um, on this property as well. 
And we're going to go and we're going to look at especially a six acre patch cut, um, NRCS funded for roughly four and a half acres of that and then the forester decided to extend that area. Um, and then there's also um, a lot of invasive treatment on this property. Um, they had a lot of barberry and a lot of other invasives. Um, so we focused on some areas for invasive treatment. And then the forester, while they were in doing the patch cut with NRCS, they also decided to do a thinning at the same time. And we're going to talk with the forester of how you might uh, integrate NRCS projects into a timber harvest you might already have or just kind of getting a logger onto your property and making it attractive to do some work. So we're going to meet at 10 in Putney. It's uh, at the end of Joy Road. We have some handouts out there because Google Maps or Google Earth, not Google Earth, Google Maps, um, it wants to send you down two roads that are not actually through roads. Um, it's pretty easy really from the center of Putney. It's just that Google doesn't know the right way. Um, so we'll be there on Saturday, 10 a.m. We'll walk through. Um, it's open. You can stay as long as you want. Um, most of it is pretty close to the road. So if you want to come for a little bit and then leave, that's fine. Um, but we're going to be discussing NRCS projects also down the road, just a short ways. There's a patch cut that was done. I think it was a 10 to 12 acre patch cut that was done um, by the same forester. And that was done, um, I believe, three years ago. So you can see how much growth is, has come in in three years. Um, it's significant. And so if you're kind of hesitant to doing a large cut, you can see um, what it looks like after a little bit. And you can, the cut we'll be seeing um, on this property was done this winter. So you also see what it looks like immediately after really. I mean, yes. How many acres is this property? The property total, I believe is over a hundred. Um, I'm not sure. Some pieces have recently been sold. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a great old apple orchard that's now over, starting to be overgrown, but um, that's kind of cool to see. Um, and then it's just a great property to kind of talk about what the opportunities were also. There's a lot of invasives on this property, but we focused on certain areas because some areas are just too far gone. And it's, um, I think it's really beneficial to see what areas we consider kind of too far gone. And it's not that they're too far gone completely, but this landowner wasn't interested in doing the maintenance work to keep those areas invasive free. And so we're not going to come in and, and treat an area if there isn't any um, really intense follow up. Yes. It looks like West, West Hill Road rather than Westminster West Road. I didn't want to confuse yeah. anybody. It, it, it may be. Yeah. Yeah. Google is because famous. Westminster yeah. West Road is down further. Google. Yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. Okay. Google um, doesn't understand Vermont. No. <laughs> I know how to get there. I just haven't tried to tell other people how to get there, so I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, you're you're right. It is West Hill Road. Um, yeah. If you try and get to Holland Hill Road, you'll you'll get there. And then it's just the Joy Road. You have to go down and around. You can't take. Um, over hill roads through. <coughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? It's, it's the West Hill Road that you have labeled Westminster West. It's called the West Hill Road. West Hill. Yeah. And then as you come off, uh, there's a fork that goes up Putney Mountain towards the Yeah, yeah. so. It's the left. Sorry. So this is Putney Mountain Road that heads up that way. That's helpful. I don't know. I'm sorry. It's Longview? Uh, it's kind of bounced around. Andy Shear has um, done most of the work. Um, Dan Haley's also worked on the property, and Alex Barrett was the one that walked out with me. So <laughs> I've seen them all. The Conservation Commission, along with Beak, is doing a planting for pollinators workshop on May 12th at Deer Run Farm, which is on the other side of town. Um, we're going to be spending the afternoon 
there's a, a, an expert coming from Massachusetts, Tom Sullivan, and we're going to be planting a, a pollinator garden and figuring out how to do that. So oh, great. So watch, watch your emails and you get information on it or give a call. Yes. Way back on the slide where you talked about mowing fields and you said rotational mowing or, you know, uh, uh, alternatives. The one or two times that I ever spent time asking um, the fellow that had been mowing our field, I said, I'd like to try this. I'd like to just take a year off and maybe do it again next year or that alternative location. And they were just absolutely, oh no, that's a very bad thing to do. You know, it grows up so fast, it'll be too hard for us to mow next year. What does that mean? Were they making money off of <laughs> hay that they're cutting? No, over? they oh. just cut it and it laid there. It's and we okay. paid for it year in and year out. Yeah, sometimes it's gonna, it might take different equipment. Um, oh. if, you, if you let it grow for a, a season, so if you, instead of cutting it in July, you wait until the end of August or into the fall to cut it, mm -hmm. you should be able to use similar equipment as normal mowing. But if you, if you wait a couple seasons, um, you might have to use like a brush hog because some, some of the vegetation is gonna be a little woodier um, okay. and just a little thicker. So that may be what they were talking about. But what you are suggesting, mm -hmm. any program that we might participate in, we could actually map out that progress and do it the right way. Yep, yep. So you can map out different parts of your property to mow like next year and mow in three years and just kind of have that rotation or just map out areas where you're gonna do just a path <coughs> and let everything else grow around it. Right. And there is, the idea of the program also is recognizing that there's a benefit to the greater good for doing that. And so there is money available, and so you might be able to find somebody a little bit more willing to do that work or pay them to use a brush hog. Um, yeah. so, question about disposal of invasives. Mm -hmm. So if you get you know, energy and you think, you're, okay, I'm gonna get rid of all this bittersweet, for instance, which is what I thought I would do on these warm days recently. <laughs> Um, so then I have this huge pile of all this stuff, and I mean, I'm going to take it to the dump. What, what are you really supposed to do with it? Or do people burn it? I mean, it's all bitter. Certainly it's burn like, it. Um, okay, if, but I mean, it, you know, then if once you burn it, then you find some more. I mean, it, it, is that the option, basically? Yeah, that's a good question, because um, they recently changed kind of their recommendations of what to do. Burning it is always a, a really good option, and you, you will have, I mean, anything, any kind of invasive work you do is going to be, it's not just going to be one and done. It's right. going to be, like you know, kind of an investment of time. Um, but if you burn it in, a, in one area, you know that that's going to be kind of a concentrated area where there probably will be a lot of seeds, so that's, that's an area where you can kind of jump on it early or focus on. Um, that would be probably one of my best recommendations. Um, in terms of other, I know because you can't bring it to like a compost facility. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, if you're able to capture just the seeds somehow, then you'd have a smaller volume and you might be able to throw those away. But could you like, I mean some, like they're like, yeah. mm -hmm. where it's wrapped around a tree. And I'm like, yeah. So I saw these pieces, but I'm like, can I burn it in the fireplace? Or, I mean, so, so I guess as far as um, killing the plant, mm -hmm. if you cut the cut the plant from the root, right. um, you want to actually cut like a gap, like two inches is recommended. Mm -hmm. So you cut like two, make two cuts, mm -hmm. um, so that they can't fuse back together. But then you can leave the material in the tree, in the tree. Okay. Um, it's not pretty, but then you're... If you're a Tarzan, it might be fun. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to I was gonna write on the board, but I don't want to use the wrong marker. Um, VT Invasives is a website, and it's got a ton of information and great pictures okay. about all these invasive species, and they'll, they'll have the best um, management disposal instructions yeah, for each true. specific. Each yep. Yeah. 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 Yes. Um, it's just frustrating. Uh, you have a, a plan to timber, and or you have a plan to clear, clear cut, 
and then all these invasives just move in. Mm -hmm. And so it's very frustrating to the landowner because to do or not to do because yes. Because of this, because I've seen all around us these invasives where this been timbered is are awful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, part of if you're in current use now, um, managing invasives is part of that program. They don't want you to do timber management at um, without dealing with the invasives and just and opening up and creating a bigger problem. Um, it's expensive, but that's kind of where NRCS kind of finds our niche um, with a lot of landowners is getting on the property and, and treating those invasives <coughs> before you do your timber harvest. Um, what if it's on the adjoining property? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that becomes definitely a little bit more difficult. Um, but if you have a consulting forester, they should be able to work with you and come up with some plan. I don't know. It, I mean, it's impossible. <laughs> it is hard, I've been yeah. doing a constant battle with uh, on my neighbor's property. It's a property line, and and I should timber in that area, but it's I know what's going to happen. It's it's, it's uh, my buckthorn that's all growing yeah, up in there. Bad one. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and I don't have it in too many other places, but it's pretty yeah. pretty uh, dense in that area. You know, a lot of times. Well, well, I'll tell landowners, you know, we're not fighting a battle that you're going to eradicate everything. It's more about control. So it's if you have a big honeysuckle bush that you know has berries every year, focus on that one and don't worry so much about the little guys that aren't aren't producing berries. And I think some of this some of this habitat work, you are going to open up spaces and invasives are going to come in, but you're also going to have native plants as well. And so I. I, my, my personal viewpoint is that you're creating more habitat and it's kind of the lesser of, of the evils. Um, I think invasives are kind of a holding action. Yeah. You, don't, you never win the war, but you might win a battle. Yeah, yeah. and so if you, um, it certainly depends on what kind of um, prescription you have for your area, um, but certainly more light will benefit, um, benefit all species and you'll get things to compete with the invasive. So even though your neighbor has a seed source that's coming in, the idea is you'll be able to get something native also that will compete with the buckthorn. Um, if you don't yourself have large buckthorn on your property that are already occupying the space, then you should be able to do management and have them at least compete with each other and not just have it 100% buckthorn. It, it, it's tricky, it's, it's yeah, it's gonna be tough. Yes? Is it possible to get money to have a neighbor's field of bittersweet brush hog? <laughs> you can, yeah, so, I mean, you have to get the neighbor if to they're agree. they're willing? But you I think can, they're yeah. willing, but I don't think they're willing to pay. Yeah, so you can, um, I can't remember what the terms are exactly with NRCS, but I think it's like um, a written agreement of lease and you technically would lease that land, get a contract for that property, and then um, have that property treated. Um, it all has to be like documented and, and legal and everything. You can't just hop over to your neighbor's property and start spraying. <laughs> but I tried a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you can, yes. Uh, I'm in the middle of harvest right now, and, and it's different from 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the uh, I, I think it's required now before a harvest to deal with the invasives in the harvest areas because I know I had to do that mm -hmm. and some other properties still have a lot of invasives but they did have to treat before the harvest mm -hmm. and the abutting property is the mother load mm -hmm. for Barbary and many other wonderful things but that property now we use the same forester Mm -hmm. So the forester approached the neighbor, and this coming for when they are about to be, they are going to deal with the invasives, or may, and they may be getting a grant to do it. But I mean, there's more than one way to deal with this, and, yeah. and if you can get that, of course, that's sort of a plug for coverts too for mm -hmm. the uh, cooperators and, and 
contiguous properties, you can, yeah. you know, you don't clear cut next to your neighbor's wetland or something. And the idea is that you yeah. maybe can try to move. Yeah, and there's, um, if we go back to that slide where I talked about the process with NRCS and the ranking, um, if you have properties that are adjoining, you actually get more of those like points for your ranking um, when your adjacent properties are also treating invasive. So that gets you higher in the state's eyes um, because you're treating a large area and you're working with other people to treat that area. So that certainly helps. Uh, to what extent do you get involved in uh, supporting planting of native plants? You know, there are some areas where I've been removing invasives and it takes out so much of the total vegetation that I've purchased native plants to put in there, but that gets expensive. Or is there any program that, you know, a nursery uh, that provides stock of native plants? Yeah. Well, the, your local resource Conservation Resource District. Um, I'm not sure what it would be here up in like the Montpelier area. It'd be like the Lanuski Resource District. They always have Wind them down here. Okay, it's so, out of Brattleboro. Okay, yeah. So out of Brattleboro, each spring they'll have um, native plant sales, and you, they're very cheap. It's Saturday. Oh, it's Saturday. It's Saturday, and it's a Green Mountain Orchard. Perfect. So yeah, we'll be driving right by. <laughs> Do you know what they're providing? There's a whole list online of everything that they have. Uh, under the Soil Conservation Service Brattleboro. I think that's what I put in to find out. Um, I don't know if you have to pre-order. Does anybody yes. know? Do you have they're, to? They're a pre-order arrangement. I know from past experience, if you go to the pickup day, sometimes they have over-purchased mm -hmm. and have a little more stock of certain plants available to people who might want to buy more than they ordered, or maybe if you show up. This year I didn't order anything, and I thought maybe I'll go up there and take a look and see what they have that's spare. But th this is the time right now, and they're easy to find online, and it's easy to get their reminder emails once a year. You just give them your email address, and they'll pop up and tell you it's time again. So, but it's only once. Yeah, and then, but there is there are NRCS practices that will help cost share planting. Yeah. So. Yes. I'm looking for people that are trying to encourage grouse mm -hmm. and, and habitat because I have heathers to give away oh, cool. and all they have to do is come and get them and I've read that in Scotland that heather is the prime thing habitat for grouse. Yeah, no, they love it. So, I, I don't know anyone personally that's around here. I think on Monday I'm going to a guy's property that wants to improve grouse habitat so I will let him know. Well, I have Probably a hundred plants. Okay. <laughs> they have receded. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Any other questions? One, one common problem, I think, when you begin to open up an area with a patch cut or, or a thinning is, is that you get uh, fern regeneration like hay-scented fern, New York fern, which are really invasives in their own right. Mm -hmm. And they totally, you know, cover yeah. the ground and prohibit anything yeah. else from growing. Sometimes you get beech, which I think of as a native invasive mm -hmm. in some places. Uh, so, you know, care needs to be taken mm -hmm. Definitely, there yeah. Um, so, we can dive into this maybe more on Saturday for anybody that wants to, but herbicide isn't the only answer, but herbicide certainly can help um, with things like fern. It takes very little to get rid of that issue, and you can do it before you harvest. No, I, I know you can, and I have herbicide yeah. fern, and it's been very successful, but unless you're certified, you can't get a chemical mixture that you know, would adequately do what's needed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, there's professionals because they're professionals <laughs> and they are licensed and um, know how to use like the smallest dose. But um, yeah, it's there's a lot of threats to native regeneration. Um, deer, I mean, are, is a native threat to I mean, regeneration. I, I 
give a commercial plug to Longview Forestry, but one of their big assets is that they've got a staff that includes people who can use herbicides as well as very good foresters and the equipment and so forth. It's kind of an all-in-one package. Yeah, there's um, more and more foresters that are becoming licensed. They've right. seen the need for that. So, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's there's lots of lots of threats and um, really. So somebody I can't remember. I'm sorry. Said that you had to. I think you said you had to take care of the invasives before. That's not a state requirement, but it's certainly most foresters are recognizing that it's much easier to take care of a problem before you open up the canopy rather than after. If you do it immediately after, it's pretty successful, but then you're climbing over a lot of brush and stuff trying to get to the plants. Yes? I just, I don't want to be the bad news bear here, <laughs> but uh, I apparently have the first example of the five-leaf aurelia invasive that is coming north from point south mm -hmm. and my as a logger identified it because last fall when everything else was brown that was a nice bright green and he said what's that and he looked it up and it's this aurelia that can grow into an immense shrub and is an invasive i don't know a lot about it i've been in avoidance mode <laughs> not studying it but i'm upset that it's there and yeah. i thought i would share that so people can be aware if it's going to start to spread like the insects do you know yeah hmm. And this is a really good time of year to start identifying invasive plants on your property because they're going to be the first plants that start greening up. So when you're driving on the interstate, you start seeing green. It's probably the honeysuckle. I saw barberry leafing out today. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, and then they're also going to be the ones that have are green longer in the fall. So. Yes. And a couple, of, several other announcements. We got green up day coming the first weekend in May. <coughs> And um, we have, um, so that's what, for whatever time you're from, you can get information on that. Uh, we have a Wise Trees program. There's um, photographers who've been traveling around the world for National Geographic that have taken pictures of these amazing, incredible trees. And that's going to be at the Broadway Museum and Art Center at 7 o'clock on this coming Tuesday. And then I told you about the pollinator program, so watch our emails, and if you want to register for that, we need to have registration for that, but that's on the 12th. Uh, and <coughs> then John Anderson, who's over here in the back, is doing a wildflower program. John spends lots of time, time meandering around Dummerston <coughs> and locales close by and taking pictures and he's going to be showing slides and describing the things that he's found. You found what over 700 botanical species here in Dummerston. We've got it all documented. Uh, and so uh, that program will be uh, May 24th at the church in Dummerston. So those are some of the things that keep an eye for lots and lots of <coughs>